Well, good afternoon, good, good evening, good morning, everyone, whatever time zone you are joining us for here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for our now very customary gathering on Sunday as we gather every week for our readings together. Uh, a shout out to our folks who joined us last week for our really amazing wild card live open mic. Today, however, we are here for our gathering, our special event um, commemorating the now uh, federal holiday in the United States, uh, Juneteenth. And this year happens to fall on the actual Juneteenth, the date. And I'll be sharing a little bit more with you about the significance of Juneteenth before we get to hear from our amazing featured readers that we have today. Um, let me remind you who you'll be hearing from and I'll tell you a little bit more about Juneteenth as well as Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm so um, honored and humbled to be able to welcome today um, D. Allen, Teresa Gallion, Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram, Rawl James, and Martina McGowan for our featured readers. And after, um, after the features, time permitting, we will move toward the open mic and folks, you can check out the chat to see how um, the, to register your interest in the open mic. Uh, we'll have about a 90 minute reading today. So we may not get to everyone on the open mic, but certainly um, if you would like to read Kim Ports Parsons with gratitude to Kim is, um, is, hurting the cats for that, for, for our open mic for today and uh, getting us ready for that event after where we will be featuring, um, prioritizing folks who will be reading on the themes related to June, Juneteenth and, and uh, original work and or the, and or the work of, of other poets who have written um, on 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 the themes that predominate Juneteenth. Well, again, you're joining us here as you join us on many Sundays. We're very grateful to have our live audience here in Zoom, and those of you, thank you, watching on Facebook. Juneteenth is, as I mentioned, since last since last year became a federal holiday in the United States. And it commemorates the um, emancipation of um, enslaved African-Americans. And it, it, it marks the actual anniversary of an announcement on the general order number three by the Union Army General Gordon Granger on June 19th, 1965, which proclaimed freedom for enslaved people in Texas. It had taken much time since Lincoln had, um, had, had commemorated the Emancipation Proclamation for that information to reach Texas. And so the Juneteenth holiday originated in Galveston, Texas, and it's been celebrated annually on June 19th uh, in different communities across the United States. Again, generally and broadly and significantly celebrating African-American culture and, a, and it was only first recognized as a federal holiday just last year in June when President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. There is a flag associated with Juneteenth, which is as well a symbol of the Juneteenth holiday. 
there are, as you can well imagine with the complex history related to um, enslavement of African-Americans in the United States and the history associated with, with racism that the themes are vast of how to approach and write about what connects us to the Juneteenth holiday. Well, today, as I mentioned, we have, we have five incredible poets who will share and create that constellation and, and share their connections with the Juneteenth holiday. And those folks are, once again, I want to honor their names and, and share them with you. D. Allen, Teresa Gallian, Michael Anthony Ingram, Raul James, and Martina McGowan. We'll hear first from D. Allen. Again, uh, D's been with us numerous times. You get to you also get to hear D on various spoken word platforms and open mics across the country. It's I always love when I am in a room and D. Allen shows up and and I'm most grateful for the times that D has joined us here on Cultivating Voices. A little more of the formal biography for you about D if you've not heard D's work here or elsewhere yet. Well, D. Allen is an African Italian performance poet based in Oakland, California. D is active in creative writing and spoken word platforms since the early 1990s. D is the author of seven books Boneyard, Unwritten Law, Stormwater, Skeletal Black, all from Poor Press. You got to hear D first here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry in one of our first new book showcases in 2020, as D was launching his book, Eloi Unitsi. And I want to, that book is from Conviction to Change Publishing. D has two new books out, Rusty Gallows from Vagabond Books and Plans from the Nomadic Press. D has had over 50 anthology appearances. And what can I say is a dynamo of a performer. I'm so grateful to have D with us today. Thank you for bringing your work to this humble stage. Thank you for having me here once again. Happy Juneteenth, y'all. I'm gonna do four poems within the expanse of 10 minutes, just so y'all can have room to listen to other poets with far more talent and awards after their name than me. And to assist me in this endeavor today, I'm gonna to use the share screen feature. Before I do that, if the person doing tech today will let me. Before I go into that, I'm gonna dedicate my portion of today's Juneteenth holiday spoken word program to two people who are present in the room, co-host Kim Ports Parsons and Lenore Good. And let me see if I could get the share screen feature working. Let me pull up the first piece first. Who? Share screen works. From Mocking Owl Roost, volume four. This is called 1865. 1865, June 19th, 
land of the Lone Star, last of the Southern states, became the first to receive news of a long bloody skirmish coming to a close. Brother versus brother, blue versus gray, America versus itself. 2,000 soldiers from the East brought the magic passage that made Africans abandon the plantation mansions, the previous owners, the croplands, psychological trammels, human bondage. Upon hearing those words spring from General Granger's lips, 250,000 of them rejoiced. The reason for parades, outdoor feast, erection of public places, expressions of pride trace back to this moment when Africans ditched their metal shackles and took their first breath of freedom without permission, moved without permission. 250,000 Blacks were freed, granted their autonomy by law. Autonomy they could have gotten as, indivi as individuals through flame, arms, revolt, or northbound travel, torches to the master's estate, hard oak to the to the overseer's head, making tracks following the North Star, leaving before the dogs caught they scent, departure before redneck rifles found them. There would have never been no need to heed the words of a Northern white blue coat then. And that first poem was called 1865, originally written in June 26, 2008, back when I was still going to college full time. And the next poem is also for this holiday. So I'm gonna use the share screen feature once more. The next two poems are gonna be coming from my new and sixth book, Rusty Gallows, Passages Against Hate. From page 84 in the book, this is called Slave State. The South's original sin hadn't missed the North. Dutch and English settlers in colonial times, brought and worked by the head, imported, living commodities, subjects of kidnapping from Africa, South Carolina, forced to build the material wealth at the ironworks farms, apple orchards, for a mo condescending kind. Social codes, bullwhip brutality, black and native together in abject captivity, the nasty little secret the garden state continues to emit from their ongoing story. It will take more than an apology from a politician's mouth for us to develop any trusted systems, Northern or Southern. And that poem was called Slave State, in, written in memory from my friend, originally from the state of New Jersey, Bruce Hansen, 1947 to 2019, rest in peace. And believe it or not, folks, New Jersey, during colonial times, was indeed a Northern slave state. This is no conspiracy theory. This is no delusional, no delusional sounding message. Check the history books. They will tell you that New Jersey was complicit in the slave trade. And the next poem I'm about to do, it looks long, but I'm gonna go through it rapid fire. And this is a job for the share screen feature. Also from Rusty Gallows, from pages 37 through 41, this is called The Mystery Ends, and this is deeply personal. 
Slavery kept us ignorant and confused and forgetful about our indigenous origins in the motherland across the Atlantic. The lily white master had some heat in his pants. Hankering for serious heat in his bed, generated with a female slave under his orders. Passion, the passion was one-sided. All over Massa's estate, there were half-breeds, quadroons, and octoroons who worked nonstop. Old Massa's occasional matings had produced a whole class of slaves kept ignorant, confused, and forgetful about their African past. Mass amnesia, it seems, is intergenerational, a confusion, a symptom. People on the street assume that I am something other than African. Fijian was thrown at me twice, and Fiji is nowhere near Africa. Guatemalan once, Puerto Rican hella times. Some people had guessed African right, but which in nationality? Ethiopian, Eritrean, Burundi, Kenyan, Somali, Sudanese, not even close. Egyptian, talk about a massive stretch. Right continent, wrong end of it. The mystery disturbs me something fierce. As history shown, the slave trade never went any, never went farther than Central Africa. Although I was born an American, Citizen, I'm disgusted to say. My Nubian genes point strong, dominant, point to a straight line to Africa's Western shore. So what was my ancestry then? Malian, Senegalese, Liberian, or Ivory Coastal? To be precise, my DNA points to a land, language, and peoples, Gabon, Mishogo and Shogo and Ateke. Ancestors' identities reclaimed along my tongue. Gabon, Mishogo and Shogo and Ateke. The country they were abducted from. The language they'd spoken before English. Both tribes they claimed as theirs. Now I could say with confidence, my history hadn't begun in shackles. Now I could say with certainty, what? who my ancient forerunners were. My newly found African past adds several new words to my vocabulary. Gabon, Mishogo and, Shogo and Ateke. Thanks to you, nephew. So determined, hungry for knowledge of self and biologist careful research. For my family and for me, the mystery ends. And that poem was called The Mystery Ends from the book Rusty Gallows, Passages Against Hate, Vagabond Books, 2022. Okay, let me get out of here for a moment. And the last poem is gonna be mowing a positive tip. And so that means I'm gonna to have to use the share screen feature one more time. And this last poem is gonna be done in commemoration of that bullshit Hallmark card holiday known as Father's Day. And that poem happens to come from my seventh and also new book, Plant. from pages 11 and 12, based on actual events and, and creatures. This is called Absent Father. The father of seven children is absent from home. Seven children are missing a playmate, missing a teacher, missing a provider. He was lured away from his personal kingdom beyond the wildlife sanctuary. A rifle, a crossbow hastened his sub subtraction from the dense equation of life. Now the royal family has a relative to lean on for basic food, warmth, safety. 
taken over the former king's duties. Seven children have another playmate, another teacher, another provider in their abode, filling the absence in, restoring the warmth loss. And so the furry lion family must continue beyond the growing cubs, beyond their uncle, the king's brother in spirit. May no hunter tear this asunder. And that last poem was called Absent Father for, African, for the African lion's Cecil, rest in peace, and his brother in spirit, Jericho. And that poem came from my new and seventh book, Plans, now available from Nomadic Press. From this might to your ears, I'm D. Allen. Thanks for listening. Happy Juneteenth. Happy, happy Juneteenth, happy Juneteenth, D. Allen. Thank you for bringing us to 1865, right up to the present, right up to the present, with always your pointed, searing. truth seeking words about history, the, the truth and the lies about it. That is what I think of when I think of your work, that you speak truth to power every single time that I've seen you and honor and honor individual people. And on, I've, I've never heard reading where D fail, where, where D does not bring someone forward for us to honor, commemorate. Oh, I'm taken by that reading. And again, folks, um, there's information about how you can purchase the books of our readers find out more information about them. I hope you will support, I hope you will support them by purchasing their collections if you have the resources available to you today. And as well, just to let you know, hoping that we will be able to bring D back to celebrate and hear in more deeper length in a new future new book showcase from his two new collections, Rusty Gallows and Plans. Not one collection this year, but two. Thing to marvel at. Thank you very much, Dee. Final quote, mass amnesia is intergenerational. You heard that from Dee today. And this is our Juneteenth reading here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry in an effort to celebrate, commemorate, um, honor, complicate, and make sure that we do not contribute as a community to uh, the mass amnesia surrounding uh, the, the history of enslavement and racism in the United States, but also celebrating the amazing culture of African-Americans and what they've contributed to the fabric of the United States. There's a lot of intersectionality in the communities, in the African-American community. And as you've already heard um, in Dee's work, an uh, ability to uh, to highlight and uh, spotlight that very fact. Well, we move we move a little bit across uh, a little bit further east 
to the, of the country from 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 Oakland to uh, to New Mexico uh, to hear from our next reader today, who's been on quite a journey herself throughout this year. If you followed Teresa Gallian on Facebook, you have had quite a travel log uh, uh, and, and getting to hear poetically and historically and personally about the connections that she's been making this, this, this year. Her poetry is, I really think of, I, I think of, I think of all I can think of is starlight and heart. I just think of the heart so much when I think of Teresa Galliant's work. Ever since I began hearing her read from her collection, the scent of love. You would be very, very hard pressed not to connect the heart, the, the heart and heartbeat, the heartbeat of her work. Well, a little more on the formal side of things in terms of introducing Teresa. Teresa E. Galleon was born in Shreveport, Louisiana and moved to Illinois at the age of 15. She completed her undergraduate training at the University of Illinois Chicago and received her master's degree in psychology from Bowling Green University, also in Ohio. She worked in the New Mexico state government, retiring in 2012. She is a seeker. And as I said, if you've been following her, she is a seeker on a journey to work on unfolding spirituality in this current and present lifetime of hers, her one remarkable life, for sure. Uh, writing is a deeply spiritual exercise for her. And as, you've, as we've noted, her passions are traveling the world and hiking the mountains and desert landscapes of the Western U.S., she considers this land sacred ground and really wherever she goes is a spiritual temple for quiet reflection and contemplation. Teresa has published four books of poetry, Walking Sacred Ground, Contemplation in the High Desert, Chasing Light, which was a finalist for the 2013 New Mexico Arizona Book Award, and her most recent book, The Scent of Love, was also a finalist in the 2021 New Mexico Arizona Book Awards. Her work appears everywhere. And she too, like Dee, is a beloved, beloved contributor to many virtual open mic platforms. And I'm none more grateful than the one that you've that you've joined here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry and and been reading with us since our early days. And I want to thank you for being here on this Juneteenth reading. Thank you so much, Sandy. I am truly honored to be a part of such a fine lineup of poets. And I'm going to switch on you all today. I'm going to read material that I have not shared with the public before. So it's going to be a whole different take. And the theme is a uh, history lesson. And it's poetry that I've written a number of years ago in my youth, another lifetime, and other times. So, but it's all related to uh, my uh, African American heritage. The first poem is called Ancestral Regression. African drums beat on the trail of tears that flood the ancestors' lips, recalls the journey across the sea of pain, chains pinching ankles, wrists, and necks, chokeholds suffocating crowded bodies in the dungeon of hell. The drums tell a story of every soul who jumped ship on an air break. 
ancestral blood painted the sea. Some tribesmen sucked air to take back to hell's holding tank, headed for the auction blocks of the Americas. Warm bodies went to the plantations of hell where you worked against the sun's fire and the overseer's whip sun up to sun down six days a week. Even in hell, you were allowed to sing on Sunday. Good care of the property was a necessity. Economics required a continued supply of new property to maintain the plantations. Bodies evolved into a rainbow of colors imprinted on the massive straw mat and burst from the womb of colored girls obedient to survival, holding on to hope. Hell's hounds addicted to meat got treats from every piece of property daring to run the woods surrounding Massa's fields. The high threat of death was not enough to stop the risk for freedom. Broken bodies brought back blatant lessons to instill fear in the heart. Death, survival, always the question. Freedom was a dream for the next generation. The colored man's slavery moved from the shanty to the sharecropper's rented space, working masses' fields to pay his eternal debts. Still, hope would simmer in the heart and pass to the next generation. O oh, children of the Southern night, swimming in tears, reach for hope, elusive hope, hope. Don't leave the children, send them north, send them east, send them west, break the chains to the masses fields. The elders struggled on in the southern fields and the children faced oppression again, just as severe in the ghettos of the north, the east and the west. The elders did not know the scar of color was a rejection ticket all across the Americas. But hope was painted on the children's breath, breath and their time was on the horizon. Tired and weary for freedom, they refused to sit on the back of the bus, insisted on sitting at the lunch counter, suffered the humiliation of desegregation, and marched the white pavement, chanting for freedom. We shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. The chant reigned across America. The theory of nonviolence met the whip of abuse, and they chose freedom now or death, marching beside Jews and Gentiles who believe freedom belonged to all souls. Oh, children of the Southern night, your memory fades from whence you came. Your elders cry for you on the steps of heaven. Where, oh, where has your compassion gone? Where is your caring for your family gone? Where is the hand held out for your brother and your sister? Where is your courage to lead the way to peace and harmony, to break the destruction? Of planet Earth. Listen, 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 children, to the cries of your ancestors. <clears throat> the next piece is called Survival Strategy. Tears rain down her face on cheeks of bubbling brown sugar full of love for her mammy. Standing on the auction block in the suit of her birth, poked and prodded in unthinkable places, assessed to see if she measures up to the standard of the master's eye. Mammy's spirit whispers in her ear, leave your body, child. Take, they can take your body, but never let them have your soul. She knows the routine all too well. She chose survival over death when she followed her master in exchange for a piece of gold. She gave up her body and released her soul. 
Mammy stands strong, holding her tears in her heart as she watches the only thing she loves taken away. Their eyes meet one last time and Mammy silently communicates in her glance, passing her survival strategy to her child. Public library. I want to touch the books and feel the words rolling across the pages. I want to go inside, sit in the big chair and read. The sign on the door says, white only. I walk slowly past the windows, scrolling a question on the glass. Tell me, Mr. Crow, what ransom must I pay to read the books in the public library? And the next piece is dedicated to my young cousin in Los Angeles, California, who is a very fine poet and who has the handle and tag, Yellow Woman. And this poem is dedicated to her in a reference to the other side of my heritage. It's called High Yellow. If I told you I was a yellow French Creole with white, black, and brown accents trying to spread my wings in the Louisiana forest of Jim Crow, you would be wondering, what the hell is that? But if you be one of my cousins, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When I say high yellow, catching hell from both sides of the railroad tracks. But we be real in our family and our high yellow tags. Come on in the house, gal, and eat some gumbo where our true love, color is love. And the last piece is dedicated to all that are here today. And it was inspired by a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That quote says, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. The title of the piece is The Peaceful Realm. You cannot reach the peaceful country with a heart filled with hate and bullets aimed at your fellow man. You cannot reach the peaceful country throwing war stickers at everyone who does not subscribe to your logic sphere. You cannot reach the peaceful country chasing those who are different from you and burning their feet. You cannot reach the peaceful country to join in harmony with all humankind until you learn to forgive yourself and others. You cannot reach the peaceful country until you surrender all negative baggage and open your arms to the broken. You cannot reach the peaceful country until all your ties with negative karma are cut no one is exempt from the universe of justice. You may come only to the peaceful country when you are ready to bend your knees in love and wrap arms in harmony. Thank you so much. Again, I am so honored to be a part of this great lineup. Light, love, peace, and blessings to each and every one of you. Thank you. Whoa, again, just taking the taking it in, taking it in. The litany of the peaceful and no one is exempt. No one is exempt from the execution of justice. What a lot, what a lot. Oh, the 
you know, I started out by saying that, you know, you're the heart, the heart and heartbeat poet. This next collection, clearly that you're working on. Let's throw, let's, let's add in. Let's add in now. You bring the heart and soul of grief and joy of history, the combination of those two. I, um, I'm waiting on the edge of my seat for the next collection of these poems that you shared with us today, Teresa. Thank you for sharing new work that with our audience that hadn't been featured elsewhere. Um, wow, I am, I am, I'm moved once again, as I always am when I hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Peace, love on this Juneteenth with immense, immense gratitude for your contributions to humanity. You always bring it, you always bring it. Well, another poet who is doing the work of bringing voices to the forefront um, and speaking and listening to the voices of those seeking to address so many aspects of humanity is our next reader. Again, uh, no stranger to our reading series here at Cultivating Voices. And I, and often lauding the praises of Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram, who joined us last year. And if uh, earlier this week, I posted last year's reading, which was featuring um, historical poems from the anthology by Broad Potomac's Shores, poems from the uh, the great poems from the the early days of the making of the United States Capitol, edited by Kim Roberts. And if you you're going to get to hear, of course, poems today. But if you want to hear one of my absolute um, favorite offerings of a poem shared by a poet. Go listen, go back to that recording that, that I've posted from the reading last year and hear Michael Anthony Ingram's contribution on that day. It was one poem, but it was an indelible, indelible reading. And I won't go into the particulars of it because I want to kind of tantalize you a little bit to go back and, and see that reading from last year's Juneteenth celebration. Well, I'm, I, I, I would be surprised if not everyone in the room was not familiar with Michael Anthony Ingram, who is the host of the podcast Quintessential listening poetry online radio. And a number of the folks here in this room have uh, had the pleasure to be featured on Michael's amazing, amazing broadcast that happens weekly, sometimes twice weekly. And I, I marvel at his ability to just bring the best out of people and the most provocative out of people with his questions that he asks when you're on the program. And 
I, I love hearing the banter between him and the poets that he, that he brings. I, I just always feel like I'm a, I'm sitting in a room listening to a really intimate conversation. Um, and it, it, they are remarkable. So please, please do. spend time with quintessential listening. And Michael is so very, very good about posting onto the Cultivating Voices live poetry page um, weekly so that you know the line, the, you know, the lineup of poet that is coming that particular week. Well, a little bit more about um, uh, Michael. Michael Anthony Ingram is the, as I said, the host of the podcast, Quintessential Listening Poetry online radio. Michael's a retired university professor. He is deeply committed to employing the arts, specializing specifically in poetry to raise awareness about issues related to the intersection of power, privilege, and oppression. He's a Pushcart Prize nominee and has gained an international reputation as a spoken word artist. Again, you're going to hear that today and really do go back and listen to that poem that, that, that he shared with us last year. Michael's second book of poetry is forthcoming, When Cherry Blossoms Fall on Black Skin. And again, I will look forward to welcoming that book here in a future new book showcase. For now, we will get to just hear some of the remarkable work of Dr. Michael Anthony Ingram. Thank All you right. for being here on this Juneteenth, my friend, and uh, Thank you. Thank grateful, you. grateful. Thank you so much. I love cultivating voices. I love cultivating voices. It's an incredible, just incredible, that's all I can say. Uh, what I'd like to do is also Father's Day. So I'd like to dedicate my performance to my father, Max Ingram, who lives in High Point, North Carolina. Now, what I'd like you to do is to imagine for me, just for a moment, we're gonna go back in time. You know, I believe as black people, we represent our ancestors. When we celebrate Juneteenth, we're celebrating our right to exist and to engage in all the riches this country and the world have to offer. But what I'd like you to do for me is to imagine for a moment that you've heard that freedom is coming, but you still never feel free to live your life as you want to live it. There's always something in the way of your achieving your dreams. Now this first piece is taken from my first book, Shelling Beans, which was published 20 years ago. It's no longer in print, but I'd like to share this work. It's called, I Can See the Tops of Trees. I can see the tops of trees, but I can't reach them. Lord knows I've tried to reach the tops of trees in my mind, in my life, in my time. And every time I scale the heights of an old oak tree in order to reach the limb the highest branch and touch the greenest leaf, reality gently but assuredly pushes me back down to the ground. And there I'm again looking up at the tops of trees in my mind, in my life, in my time. I can see the peaks of mountains, but I can't reach them. Lord knows I try to reach the peaks of mountains in my mind, in my life, in my time. And every time I climb the cliffs of the craggiest mountain in order to taste the pureness of untainted snow, reality gently but confidently pushes me back down to the ground. And there I'm again looking up at the peaks of mountains in my mind, in my life, in my time. I can see the crest of clouds but I can't reach them, Lord knows I try to reach the crystal clouds in my mind, in my life, in my time. 
And every time I fold my arms in order to cradle a whisper, God's immaculate breath. Now she gently but willfully pushes me back down to the ground. And there I'm getting looking up at the crystal clouds in my mind, in my life, in my time. I can see the meridian of the sky, but I can't reach it. Lord knows I try. I reach the meridian of the sky in my mind, in my life, in my time. And every time I stretch out my arms in order to see some peace of Mount Olympus on high, now it gently but deliberately pushes me back down to the ground. Then I'm again looking up at the meridian of the sky in my mind, in my life, in my time. Reality, won't you stop pushing and please let me dream, let me reach, let me love, let me be. Now, being a black man in this country has been, being black in this country, but being a black man on top of that, it's been fraught with difficulty from the very beginning. Now, I don't know whether it'll ever end. So my next piece, the title is taken on a play on Anne Rand's work, Atlas Shrugged. This is titled, Black Atlas Shrugged Again. Black Atlas shrugged again, for they had made him a world and forced him to carry it on his back. They thought it would break him, silence him, and weaken him, because he'd been colonized in that question, bastardized to destroy family and kin's affections, and subsidized to ensure that he did not make the connection. Black Atlas shrugged. They had made him a world and forced him to carry it on his back. A world where marginalization and fear permeated the air, stifling his creativity, suffocating his sense of humanity, channeling his energies and directions that exhausted his resistance and made him deny the majesty of his ancestral existence. Black right Atlas shrugged again. But they made him a world and forced him to carry it on his back. A word that created a codependence and made him feel as if he could not live without assistance. Black Atlas shrugged again. They had made him a world and forced him to carry it on his back. And like a coat that does not fit. One day he lifted their world off his back and held it above his head, but their world was not big enough to contain his mind, was not heavy enough to break his not proud enough to possess his spirit. And like a toy, was unconcernedly from a small child's hand, he dropped their world to the ground beneath his feet. And from the debris, a victim of indignity and false superiority, he reached down and created his own world. A world made from the rich, sweet-smelling clay on the shores of West Africa and in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Dark clay that told the story of separation from the motherland Middle Passage and the sands of a foreign land. Yes, he made his own world. Fashioned from the soul of Martin, the song of Billy, and the words of Langston. A world that embraced his color and gave him the strength to uplift his sister and his brother. Black Atlas shrugged no longer, but he had made his own world and he lifted it above his head and he said, see God, see God. It is as you said it should be. All right. I like your side of peace now. I'd like you to work with me and listen. It may seem different, but I want you to listen. It's called a case of domestic violence. My mother never loved my father. My father never loved my mother. Their relationship was abusive from the start. Entered against her will. Her beauty polluted. He was forceful, taking, robbing, raping. Her spirit faded into ghostly shadows, ghastly and fearing, and so achingly alone. No friends anymore, no family, a place to call her home. 
Her dignity was a dry dungeon abandoned of which she told her she would never return. His violence was an ocean air and flow, an endless source, unpredictable, slow, quick, and mocking. He called her ugly in front of his friend. They laughed and called her ugly too. He was a master of humiliation and she did not know what to do. His lust was unimaginable, raging jealousy and possessiveness. He knew of her hatred and how his touch was despised. Oh, fingers, oh, manhood. At night in the darkness, he rejoiced when she cried or pleaded, please, no more perversion. His insatiable appetite to assault her extended to his friends. His friends used her to no end. Please stop. I can't take it anymore. I'm dying. He said, pity you, victim. We have none. And we will defile you to the rising sun. You have walked through this open door, but the way is shut. So you now must stay tough. So he was diligent. Watching, gauging, and guessing, when she tried to escape mercy north of his grip, he was a man scarred and uglier with each passing sin, and there was no way to remember all of them. Yet, despite it all, she was still majestic of noble character and determination. The ability that she had to nurture us to be courageous children, now men and women, despite our violent roots, we know somewhat of the truth. I am a child of an abusive relationship. My mother's name is Africa. And my father's name is America. I wrote this piece. It's the new Colossus, a letter to Emma. The new Colossus is the title of the poem graven on a tablet within the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty in the New York City Harbor. The most famous words, even your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free are known and beloved by many people. Here's my open letter to Emma Lazarus, the author of the poem. Dear Emma, your simple words undoubtedly serve as a comforting balm for many weary sea travelers. A sturdy branch to hang an indomitable spirit, a steadfast beacon to those who sail from European shores to distant lands where pink and white skin tones fleshed out the living canvas. Yet, Emma, I must ask the question what about me? Did you not see my boat pull in as you compassionately called out to those who travel from lands beyond the shoulder of liberty? I too had traveled rough and uncertain seas. My body ached. And my spirit cried day and night. I was confused, fearful, and uncertain about what lay ahead of me. I was angry and bewildered about what had been stripped and torn from me, the middle passage, everlastingly engraved in my heart. I chanted songs of sorrow for both the living and the dead. Dead men and women and children who unknowingly sat beside me. So, Miss Emma, what about me? Soon to be viewed by all as three fifths of a man, my dignity peeled off along with my 40 acres and a mule. I too, huddled with masters, yearning to breathe free, masses panting and like me slowly dying, masses which were mirror images of the brown clay, low morning sun, ruby sunset, and auburn colored nights that framed the time it took you to write your lauded verse. I too, and one of the tired, and one of the poor, huddled in a yearning mass to breathe free. So Emma, I saw you standing there on the shore. How did you not see me? Sincerely, a fellow American. This last one, very quickly. In for my book. In for my book. <laughs> Again for my book, Shelling Beans. It's called Grammatically Incorrect. I am not a noun a personal thing that you can possess by adding the letter S. You can't pluralize my being, my essence of my soul to function solely as an object of your mind's construction. I am not a verb. You can't conjugate me at will and think that it's okay. My action is a reaction to your stagnant state of being. I will not change my tense or my mood or my voice, any aspect of me to assimilate to your assumption 
of perfection. I am not an adjective. You can't modify or subjugate my life. I am not dependent on you for my existence because I can stand alone and live with a unique individual empowered and proud to be who I am. I am not a conjunction or a preposition. You can't either and or butt me out of existence because I can stand alone and live with who I am. Nor can you relegate me to a phrase and place me before the world and expect me to express an idea that is not my own. What I am is grammatically incorrect. My language is the language of difference. I do not conform to standard usage or prescribe ways of thinking, knowing, believing, loving, aging, or behaving. Take me as I am. I am creatively and uniquely whole, totally me, grammatically incorrect, but free. I thought I was ready for your reading. I thought I was ready. I thought I was ready. I prepared myself. I was like, I know what Michael's going to bring. And I was not ready. I was not ready. Oh, my gosh. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I... what's gonna to continue to ring through my head all day long is I must ask the question, what about me? The litany of that will probably linger with me for like forever actually not just today, not just hours from now, not tomorrow, but really that one has to assert that question in the incredible presence of systemic oppression and erasure and to try to and and to cry that question out as you cried that question out and then i am the product of an abusive relationship i mean honestly we every single one of us is a product of an abusive relationship i agree that was not just that was not that it's not just the singular I as every, you know, and uh, just here in the States and everyone who bears wit, everyone who's born witness is the, is in, we're all, we're all the product of that abusive relationship. Uh, I think it exists concentrically, depending on how close you are to the epicenter but the epicenter is very close to most people. And that, so I really, as I was encouraging folks to go back and look at Michael's contribution from last year, come back to this reading folks and listen to all five poets I mean, the two that are upcoming, but every single one of our, every single one of our poets today has left us a legacy of words to contemplate, honestly, for the rest of our lives. Thank you, Michael. Um, you and thank you for, as you always do, asking us to listen. But boy, did you bring the questions today? Did you bring the questions today? It came from the heart, Sandy. I know it did. I know it did, my friend. I know. I know it did. Oh, oh my gosh. We look forward to your upcoming book and also 
Hmm, maybe we can get that that 20 year old book out of print somehow. Maybe we can find a way to do that and get that work back. And thank you for sharing the expanse of the, the expanse of the expanse of your work. Well, I'm I'm really I, I it's a good thing I'm sitting because I I I I don't think I'd be able to stand up. <laughs> I don't think I'd be able to stand up. Um, and yet I must I must move the program along, everyone. Um, sometimes there are days when I wish I was when I wish I was an audience member where all I had to do was deeply listen. That where that's all I had to do. And uh, this day is one of those days. But nevertheless, there is deep joy and just pleasure in being able to introduce these remarkable poets to you today. Um, it's it's such an honor and, and a deep privilege. And and um, we've recently connected with Rawl James, and I'm so grateful for Rawl's voice here on Cultivating Voices. And if you've not been listening to Rawls' work, if you've not had the pleasure of hearing Rawls' work at the various venues where that Rawls participating in as well, we're all so fortunate today that that he's joined Cultivating Voices and that we will be moved by just his remarkable voice. I loved Rawls' bio that Rawl shared with me. Uh, I, I, I am a fan of the bios that tell us more than just the publications and, and that go into the, the spirit of what is behind the poet. That's the true biography. So let me share with you Rawl James' biography. Rawl would tell you that he is a student of life and thus life is his greatest teacher. He is a personal leadership and spiritual coach, inspirational speaker, and poet that uses poetry as an invitation to examine life. He's committed to being in the service to those seeking a holistic and inside out approach to understanding themselves and tapping into their vault of wisdom. Their vault of wisdom. Oh. You are your purpose. Rawl says, you are your purpose. You are not broken, nor do you need fixing. You are your purpose. You are not broken, nor do you need fixing. Rawl James was born in Trinidad and Tobago and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He also spent time in Los Angeles, Washington, DC, has lived the majority of his adult years in Toronto, Ontario, and Kelowna, BC, Canada. He spent over 25 years in the corporate world in a variety of roles, performing numerous and various tasks alongside good-hearted and well-intentioned people. And today, we get to hear of the expansive heart and mind and contributions of Rawl James. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Sandy. If I can just get you to take that piece and send it to me, I'll use it forever. So I, I thank you for that beautiful intro. You, you made my words sound even more elegant than they are. I am beyond humbled and honored to be among such an esteemed panel of poets. I consider you guys poets. I still struggle with that title, especially when I 
listen to your brilliance and the compassion and truth that you speak with. So I am humbled and, and honored. Um, what I'm about to share with you, I share freely. I invite you to let go of the guilt and shame of the past. I offer these words as celebration because we are here, I am here. And being that it is Juneteenth and we are celebrating this last version of slavery of our blackness and the resurrection from that, I offer these words. And I think it's only fair I would start with a poem. I may have recited it here before. I don't know exactly where I've recited things. <laughs> But this piece, in spite of, of the many pieces I've written, is the only time I ever felt I was channeling a voice from the past. So I offer this piece. It's called, How Did I Get Here? The idea of freedom eludes as my mind constantly returns to the question, how did I get here? I can no longer make sense of my circumstances as each moment looks like the last. Competing thoughts flood my mind as reality negotiates with the last of my entrusting hope. Body beyond exhaustion, fueled only by Yah's will. I now live unseated upon the unseated land of those whose tribe has no name. Not in my time, my, lion, my land lays beyond the horizon, connected only through lucid moments in my dreams. It's been many moons since I felt the dirt of my village underfoot. Surrounded by the morning air as I welcomed the sunrise amber with my father, laid lazily on the banks of the river where my grandfather swam as a boy, Rested in the safe embrace of my mother's story as my imagination came to life in the star-filled playground of the night sky. Desperation and despair are my guides in this bittersweet moment of rest. Caught in an instant of disconnect, faint voices of my ancestors bang the drums of memories in this confusion of bondage. Forced to live as a stranger with those estranged from their ways as we are now corralled in dis-ease as the conqueror's bounty. Is it the land that makes me hold or the blood that came before? I did not choose this faith for faith chose me to be enslaved. In this plane where time has no meaning, I endure the pain and suffering of indignity Necessity and the circumstances forge a new family of souls with whom I share this harshness. And together, we witness new life and share in mistrusted laughter despite it all. I sometimes cry and cower in shame, in respite from the yoke and whip. I take to arms in my mind against my captors, but always, I laugh in my tears, if only to make sense of my stolen manhood as I await my return to the birth of my land. I sometimes wish breath would be foreign, but my demise is still a time away for I keep fighting from my home within. I am a descendant from the dark place that shed light upon the heavens, beholden to my past and devoid of this now, bearer of hope for a better tomorrow. And as I fight through the harshness to survive, each scar symbolizes the spilt blood of my strength and courage. So today, I lay here to rest, for tomorrow I will face the madness yet again, to look fear in the eyes and to laugh some more for I am still here, end of poem. Uh, this next piece that I'd love to share with you is another old piece, I'm sure I've recited it here. When I write, I don't necessarily write for anyone that's black or white or Chinese or any other ethnicity, I write for our humanity, but I'm also proud of my blackness and I'm also proud of those that came before me. 
this piece that I, I'm going to present is called Necessary for You. And one day maybe I'll do something different with it. I present to you, accept it as you will. From the fringes of my consciousness, I pen this piece in hopes of inspiring and awakening from the distractions of life's bullshit. Deception cast a wide net over wisdom as we live in this fear-induced construct of ignorance. I'm caught up in a landslide of thoughts as I fight the downward tumble of energies in our midst today. Debris of our human frailty fills the airwaves and suffocates the good that still exists in our hearts as we rumble and toil towards making sense of whom we are. We live in a world where freedom is written and spoken, yet the stigma of colonialism holds the people in a vice grip of institutional slavery that favors one race over another. While many remain imprisoned in glory days and others embrace a mindset that blankets the past with the morality of the present day. I am not a nigger or my nigger. As James Baldwin said in his talk, take this hammer. It was an invented word. It was necessary to you, not me. It reflects the tears, sorry, reflects the fears that dwelled within to cover a false sense of superiority through conquest and greed. I am human, black, my walk. Not a condemnation of race, but a celebration of pigmentation. I simply speak my truth and my truth fears no investigation. I pen these words as a free man of thought. I'm the many times grandson of those who birth the light from the dark. My blood is the blood of kings and queens, the architects of great civilizations. My ancestors experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm a proud descendant of those for whom the yoke of oppression goes past the Atlantic, Africa, and Arabia to when we felt the lash of pharaohs and sultans. Scattered to the four corners, our history was hijacked, discredited, and whited out to keep us disconnected and uninspired. Families, culture, and our own sense of self rewired. Our men were raped of their essence to be made boys, our women's virtues valued as concubines for amusement. While truth remained foreign to our minds, our tongues, our hearts. My ancestors' spirit was under constant barrage of hell's fire. Their humanity denied, bodies beaten, crushed beyond the recognition as pleasure derived from having the race beaten beyond the molecular makeup that binds all life. Their daily bread was barely enough to sustain life, never enough rest to honor the temple while praying on bloodstained knees waiting for the judgment day of the master's sins. I call upon the spirit of my ancestors to guide my steps. I honor the sacrifice made by standing up to injustices with hope for fueling a revolution where no pound of flesh is required as penance. I've looked within to love past the anger and the hatred to the wisdom welted upon your backs, hidden in the scarred and cracked lines in your faces from years in the sun-baked fields, the thickened rubber-like skin of your hands from centuries of making bricks and picking cotton that built wealth for others but never of your own. In the chambers of my soul, I hear your voice echoing the call for the liberty that ties us in the single garment of destiny. Your Songs of freedom stayed constant as you carried this burden because it was yours to carry. And as your ashes long return to the earth to enrich growth, the wind kicks up the dust of your bones as a reminder of that which cannot be broken as we await our own warrior, a warrior soul's awakening. I issue a call to the four corners, to all my brothers and sisters, 
Free your heart of fear to unshackle from the mental slavery of oppression. Know the truth about us, the truth that we are a mighty people. Know whose back took the lash before you raise your hand against your own. Know whose truth was denied before you speak with contempt and disrespect of our mothers and sisters. Know the lives not lived before you want to end that of your brother. The time has come for us to take our rightful place in the race. Our lives have to matter to us. Our history, our true history must matter to us. It is no longer us versus us or even us versus them. Let us no longer be blind, deaf, and dumb as we embrace a mindset that casts out the insanity of indifference. We want strength of freedom. It is time to awaken from the experience of mental entrapment and no longer be our own plantation masters. We must be free within to live free together. Let us, let us leave upon Caesar what is Caesar and not attempt to fix what is not broken, but to build anew that which values all life. We are the fulfillment of prophecy that Nate Turner and Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King and Shirley Chisholm and Stephen Biko, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu spoke of. Let us get right with our history so we are not stuck in the hypocrisy of our history. For the time is upon us to walk with grace and dignity as we overcome and deliver on the promise of getting to the mountaintop. It is said that the truth shall set you free, but only if one is open to the truth that binds us. We all walk the same earth, breathe, the same air, drink the same water. We all come from woman and death will visit us all. Let us not be colorblind, but be human sighted. End of poem. And it's been a while since I read that. So thank you for that. I have a couple of more I'd like to, 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 to read before I sign off and pass on to the next presenter. This piece to me is in honor of Martin and the dream. And as a reminder to us about the dream and a call to action as we move forward. I call it, what happened to the dream? In 63, they marched for jobs, freedom, and he spoke of a dream of civil rights, economic freedom, and the end of segregation. And the hope was for when I would be judged by the content of my character. He lived in a time where government assistance was a helping hand and not a way of life. This minister spoke of getting to the mountaintop and the promised land. Is it the more we speak it, the more the illusion becomes reality? Or are we the privileged people living in this promised land? Are we not the content of character or are we still consumed by pigmentation? I am not just of my parents, but a child of Yah's light birth from the dark. And I am the sum of my struggles as my growth is measured by deeds. Have we not come a long way and experienced many strides since 1619 to when a man stood on steps and shared a dream of hope and equality? He lived in a time when the laws of the land said no colored, whites only, no niggers, dog at dogs attacking as we fought to no longer be exploited. And in 64, the high court of the land recognized that all men were created equal. It was never easy, it wasn't political, for it was about flushing ignorance with justice. So what happened to the dream, the promised land that he saw? 
It is not just a black dream for the dream is for all people of all lands. But what did the consequences bring us? We canceled voices with shame and guilt while identity is the privilege that some speak as a clever way for racism to not die. A bamboozle of distraction for the victimized by the liberal champions of the cause. But out of the civil rights cocoon, the rescuer encourages focus without critical thinking. As the loudest shout Black Lives Matter to the distracted of a revolution televised. No need to lower the bar for my stride is gifted and I'm the end result of a democratic wave. I am the recognition and the understanding of the difference between the everythings of Yah's breath and the nothing as I no longer wait for the right time. So here I sit in 2022 with pen in hand. I am not marginalized, oppressed or a victim. And I can never not be in the right time, for I'm always in the right time for justice to prevail. From the mountaintop, he looked into the promised land and he saw me. And although he did not drink of the milk and honey, we carry him in our hearts. As we the people, black, white, yellow, brown, Jew, Muslim, Christian, Gentile, for we, the village, rejoice in a single garment of unity. For we are the promised land. End of poem. And I will end with a piece that I, uh, is a thought that just came to me last night. And oddly enough, I didn't write it down. And this morning, it was still there. So it was obviously meant for me. I don't know if it's complete. I don't know if it's a poem. It's just a thought but I'm gonna share it with you because it fits into why we're here today and why we've gathered in this celebration of not just poetry, but a celebration of our humanity to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice so we, all of us can be here today. And I just simply call it, I am black. I am black. My shading is a rep representation of my humanity and the walk of resilience of my ancestors. I am black, not a condemnation, for there is only but one race, and I am celebration of life. I am black, a reflection of that which birthed the light to shine bright, brightly in this time, in this space. I am black. My excellence is not determined by pigmentation, but flows from the grace of creation. I am Black, inhaling the magnificence of the examples afforded by those who came before. I am Black, an image of divine love, and my mane is a symbol of my faith and strength. I am Black, the dream of my elders that proudly and with gratitude, I say thank you. I am black, free to be, for not even my maker defines me and I need no permission to be. I am black, end of poem. Poets, once again, you've honored me. Thank you so much. Cultivating Voices, I love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this and the opportunity an embracement into your community. I love you all. Well, James, I love you. I, I'm sure the collective we loves you. I wanna give that right back to you, my friend. Receiving with an open heart. My oh, wow. So many lines that I would like to echo back, but in the interest, and if I did that, I'd basically be doing the whole reading all over again, <laughs> echoing back the whole reading all over again. Um, Again, the, the litanies of humanity that you bring and elevate 
to your work carried incredibly also the messages amplified, continued to amplify the messages of Dee and Teresa and Michael so well. And I think, and then it's in the chat, you'll see, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the many lines that really held me was, let us not be colorblind, but human-sided, human-sided, human-sided. That, 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 that amplification that you brought to the work, the This is an exceptional display of why we why it's so necessary for us to gather and hear the and hear and hear the work. of our black brothers and sisters. It's important to hear so that we can understand the connections and the differences between us with in mind the notion that if, if there's any single person that's not free, then none of us are free. And that we all need to work toward that day where justice prevails so that we can truly live the promise of what humanity really is intended to be about and step into that rather than continue to stay on the edges of that. I'm, I'm, D, I'm, D, I'm, I'm D, I, I have nothing to say. I, I, I feel like a, a, record, a broken record today to, to say that I'm just so deeply grateful for the work today and to be filled and moved by it. And well, Thank you. Just, I have no other words than just thank you. Right. I mean, there's, yeah. Oh. Strong people, Sandy, all of us. And yeah, indeed, indeed. Strong indeed. and we, you know, I believe every day, although right now, the way things are in our times, it feels like we're going backwards. I'm not one of these people that believe that. We're transforming, we're trying to figure things, how to move to the next understanding of our humanity. And it, Transformative change gets messy. It's, it's never neat. It's not tied in a bow. You know, it's like making an omelet. You got to break the eggs to make the omelet. And the eggs. Eggs, it gets messy at times. And sometimes you get chunks of, of white shelves in it. But, you know, I believe every day we're getting better at it. Um, you know, I embrace my blackness. But when I say black or white, I don't mean race. I don't believe in multiple races on this planet. There's one race that's made up of 31 different flavors. And one of the reasons I love coming to, to places like Cultivating Voices is that I get to hear Teresa's and Marcus's and Martina's and Dee's experience of their blackness. There is no one black voice, just like there's no one white voice. And right. you know, slavery is just a small part of my history. Yes, it's 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 and a it it speaks to the strength of where I come from because I am here and we are here. And it's on it's in our hands to learn from the past so that we don't repeat and build anew. That's why I said leave on to Caesar's what is Caesar. The system was designed to do what it did, and yet it didn't break us. I'm still here. You're still here. <laughs> anyway, I love you all. Thank you. Well, uh, this the reading today was just I I I knew I knew 
and then I couldn't and and I and yet I couldn't anticipate. I could anticipate and I couldn't anticipate and it's it's it exceeded any any vast expectations I had because I knew the work was going to be exceptional and it is just built on that every minute every minute of this after for me this afternoon well I move us to our final feature for today again another poet that we have been so fortunate to hear numerous times here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry, and you're familiar with Martina's work, and it is, I'm now very pleased to say that it is and continues to be award-winning work. It is, it is getting the recognition that it deserves, um, because of the power of the work. I mean, when it's when it's the truth, it's the truth, and there it is. So I'm always humbled and honored to be able to present Martina McGowan to to this audience um, because I really, really believe in her work and her being and her spirit. And I'm grateful for I'm 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 grateful for the, I'm grateful for that book. I am the rage ever since I originally read about it, and the first time I was able to hear it. Well, let me share with you a little more on the more formal bio here. Martina Allen is a physician, a poet, a writer, an artist, an advocate, and an activist against social, racial, and sexual injustices. It's not in that order, and it is in that order, and it's in every permutation. Her debut collection, I Am the Rage, has indeed garnered numerous awards, including, including very recently, the International Book Award for Poetry and Social Change, which is a Goodreads Choice Award nominee. She received also the Black Caucus of the American Library Association Award the Royal Dragonfly Award from Story Monsters and a Nautilus Award for Poetry. Her work has been published vastly in literary magazines, journals, and anthologies everywhere. And again, um, we are always so fortunate when we have the opportunity to get to hear her work because she often is a person in the audience listening to all of to all of our work and a very devoted member of Cultivating Voices. So thank you for being here today, Martina. And I'm very grateful to have your work be part of our Juneteenth celebration and acknowledgement. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I want, before I start, uh, thanks to Sandy and Kim and Don and the whole Cultivating Voices family for all your continued support. Um, thanks to the audience members who've stayed. Uh, this has been, uh, these are hard things to listen to uh, for some people and it's um, a day of questionable celebration, but we'll come to that. Uh, and, thankful, and I'm thankful for all the readers, all the people that I love to hear and I hate to follow, um, but we'll get through it. <laughs> So I like to start my sets um, with uh, honoring one of my poetic forebears. I will start with Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life I had no model? Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, 
my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and failed. Juneteenth is uh, from the book, I Am the Rage. From Lincoln to Granger to the enslaved, imprisoned and the powerless, a two year journey lost on the lips of a nation still embattled and embittered, a not so new holiday celebrating freedom. Freedom, a single word that should have meant blessing but it was a blessing thwarted, choose your story the government agent killed along the way to deliver the good news or withholding news to bring in a final slave driven cotton harvest for profit. Free but not free, not slave and not freeman, free-ish in a country we do not know or understand. Freedom leaving broken families still broken, broken tongues still lost and a multitude of broken spirits new status on paper, but never in hearts, celebrating the end of human trafficking, except it wasn't, making an unhealthy contract, a perilous and corrupted deal with the devil, yielding futures caught in amber, a new life coupled with old complications, complaints, complicity, conflagrations, and confusions because someone must be the lowest caste. We watch as this involuntary arc of freedom rings in a new era, but by our own choosing, drags with it broken shards of centuries of hate so we can continue our detrimental obsessions. Two years and two centuries, a few things have changed. The trollers have traded their tattered rags for riot gear, swapped out their whips for tasers and bullets. Most of our lives remain locked in trauma, unhealthily much the same. So, dare I say, happy Juneteenth. This is a sort of an ongoing work in progress. Who we're from, who I'm from. Plucked from starlight playing in forest, passed through the gates of hell and barracoons, Imprisoned in a belly for 13 days, Highland Heather plastered to my DNA. Up from the sticky sweet sap of stout pines, barbed and prickly cotton, 200 pounds a day. Flesh, timber, bowls, all on the auction block, tumbled down slave quarters, turned into homes. From Peter, an emancipated slave, and Lucretia, a six foot wonder, cotton scarred hands, caring for grands cooking, smoking her pipe, sharing our history. I am from red clay pounded into concrete, hard streets and even harder women doling out wisdom and hard earned lessons, love buried deep like diamonds, hard to see. I am from running across hot tarred rooftops and yoo-hoos and orange knee highs, marbles, stick balls and flying free from swings before I knew I was prey. Tiny apartments filled with family, and aromas of food from down home, a blessing circle big enough for Jesus wept to be said once again. Kids with smiling eyes, side rolling, waiting for another unchurched to say he sure did, risking a finger pluck from an aunt and the death stare from my mother. Fathers who adored us but drank too much, crushed beneath the world's weight, brothers who loved too many cousins, molesting those they did not, women breasting the evil tide. I am from people learning one form of training, push their children's hearts away, hoping to save them from corruption, from death. A people who rose from little, who dreamt on for their children's children's sake of a better world than they received. This is a song for all the generations holding one long breath, sharing the story of the joy, love and hope that still lives inside our pain. And I am the rage, I think I've read here many times, it's the anchor poem for the book. I am the rage. I am the rage, roiling just beneath the surface. I am the dream deferred again. I am the promises needed and repeated, but never kept. I am the air between light and dark, 
fueling flames that burn but can neither be consumed nor satisfy its own abiding hunger. I am the glowing embers you continue to poke and prod with meanness that bubbles over onto the streets. I am the ravenous appetite to destroy something, anything. I am the ever present clanking chains in the belly of the cargo hold, struggling to love myself a thing you have taught me to loathe. I am the dismal days and inky skies. I am the niggardly feeling that there is not enough, will never be enough money, land, freedom, education, life to satisfy us all. I am the outrage that flares every time you say something foolish like, I thought you were already free. I am the disappointment that breathes hot and silent every time I am dismissed, discharged, dishonored, cast aside, counted as worthless or meaningless. I am the melody that lies inside every Negro spiritual that sings praises of diminishing hopes in this life and a brighter, fairer world in the next. I am the mother who wields the belt that cuts both ways that beats my children in hopes that you will spare their lives. I am the salty tears of anxious mothers, frightened each time her child crosses a threshold, praying for a return that is not guaranteed like payment of some impossible garnishy on the lives we want for them. I am the furthest point from you thrashing about in the sea of doom. I am the dark fiber that runs through our shared history that will not allow us to forget a constant reminder to both of us that I can never go home can never find home. I am the rage running unbridled through the streets. I am the fire this time. I am the rapacious thirst seeking justice for all on these dusky days and obsidian nights. I am the rage, the lies within the powder keg of unfulfilled lives awaiting the spark. I am the rage. I am the lost sheep. I am the muted prayer that we will see each other clearly one day. And I will finish up with a sweeter song, which I've read here before, after Etheridge Night. You ask for sweeter songs, better rhymes and lighter melodies, but my poor heart cannot comply for the truth is all we have on offer. Promises of light-filled days remain empty lasting happiness in short supply, islands of joy, contentment, sinking in seas of setbacks. I too dream of fresh breezes caressing my face, walking white sands, chasing waves, wallowing in wildflower fields, toes dipping carelessly into cool creeks, basking in moonlight beneath a blanket of stars awaiting the opening of asylum doors, co-signing my sluggish freedom, anxious to release the sorrow, the heartache, and watch them float away. Some other day, I shall sing to you of peace and love and hope. Some other day, I shall write of beauty and nature, but not this day. Today, I am but a canary, caught in life's coal mine, inhaling double doses of air so that you may breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina. Uh, every, time, every time I hear I am the rage, there's different parts of it that, 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 that echo for me. And if you here in the audience are are hearing um, the title poem for the first time. Uh, I urge you to. Uh, I urge you to run your fingers quickly and order and order and order this collection for your collection, um, because the entire collection speaks to that that very complex prismatic way of how a person navigates history and moves into the present to live a life of integrity and to kind of speak, continue to speak the truth, just continue to speak the truth. 
about how injustice and justice intersect and or miss each other and the cost of that, the consequences of that, as well as elevating the joys of being human. Uh, I often say grief and joy are always holding hands and that Martina's work strives to to really hold that message true. And uh, again, uh, you heard me, you heard me name the many places that this work has been recognized and for very, very good reason, for very, very good reason. So in addition to supporting Martina and her press, I encourage you to also um, look to all of our readers today and supporting their work as well. Well, before we turn to a very, very truncated open mic, I'm sorry folks that, you know, we went, we went long. That's probably on that. Well, that is on me, of course. Um, and so I want to get a few folks in and mostly folks who uh, haven't read with us for very long. Um, but before we do that, let's unmike, just unmute for one moment and give our deepest appreciation on this Juneteenth to our five featured readers. Dion. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Bravo. 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 Pusha. Pusha. Michael Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Incredible. Incredible work, everyone. Thank you. Blessed. Blessed. We're very, yes, we're very, very fortunate that these folks joined us today um, on Juneteenth with many, many other choices. So as I said, I'm gonna, I'm going, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do for the open mic folks, I, I, I had 12 people on the open mic, we'd be here easily another hour. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to those folks that we really haven't heard from for a time. Um, if and some are folks that have never read with us before, so it, it, it is it is not a slight at all. If I do, if if you're if I don't have you read today, please don't take it that way. It's just I want to be respectful of having an audience for those who read, and also giving us an opportunity to hear from uh, folks that we haven't um, that that we've not heard from um, that we've not heard from for a time, if, 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 if not at all, if, if this is their first time, this is their first time here. So I'm going to have a start. And if you could keep a poem to less than three minutes, that would be, it's one poem, less than three minutes. Um, and if um, I'll take us to, I'll take us to 215 and we'll see how many folks we can get in. I'm going to start with our, our good friend Latoya Whipple and I'll have Latoya followed by Mary, by Mary Louise Kiernan, who studied with Louise Clifton, and put that in the put that in the chat. Would you like me to go now? Yes, if you would, please. I'm so glad you're here today. Well, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. I will be sharing with you all a very short piece from my new book, and. The piece that I'll be sharing today is entitled, It's Celebration Time by LaToya Whipple. It's time to share the atmosphere. It's time to prepare the table with the finest tablecloths. Arrange the china and the most elegant glasses around the table. It's time to coordinate the decorations of the celebration for the grand occasion. It's time to dance. It's time to laugh. It's time to celebrate in peace. Thanks for listening. 
Thank you. Thank you, Latoya. Great to have you with us here today, on Juneteenth. I'm so, so grateful for your work and look forward to hearing more from that new collection. Thank you greatly. Indeed, we'll now hear from Mary Louise Kiernan, followed by Larry Kirshner. Thank you, Sandy. But, you know, I do have a poem. It's about social justice, but it's not really connected to Juneteenth. So I think I should give the time to someone else who's worked on something for Juneteenth. I appreciate, I appreciate your deference. I appreciate your deference. Come yes. back and read that poem. I will. You would. Thank yes. You. Okay. So we'll hear now next from Larry Hirschner. And uh, what an incredible bunch of poets. It made me think of a time when I was doing a presentation following the Reverend James Lawson. And as he was coming off stage, I jokingly said to him, how can I follow you? And he said, you just keep going on. So this, this is a poem, uh, as Dee and, and Michael alluded to, this is also Father's Day. So this is a poem about my father's, how my father's life intersected with a violent racism. And it's called, Dad was 10 years old. <clears throat> Dad was 10 years old living in Marion, Indiana when photographer Lawrence Beitler snapped a photo of the all white crowd, men, women, and children shouting and jeering in a public mixture of racial satisfaction, hostility, and amusement at strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. The mob of thousands performed their drama throughout the night in the courthouse square shouting, they must hang at terrorized black teenagers, Tom Ship, Abe Smith, and James Cameron held in the Marion jail for the supposed murder of Claude Dieter and the rape of Mary Ball. The Muncie evening press estimated that of the thousands gathered around the jail, only about 75 men actually took part in the rioting. Encouraged by the shouts of onlookers penetrating the front and the side of the jail using crowbars and hammers. August 6, before they could stand trial, the mob tore the young men from their cells, brutally beating and mutilating them in a spasm of white supremacy. Smith was taken first and lynched from the jail bars. When first pulled up, he held onto the rope, preventing strangulation. So he was dragged into the courthouse square and hung from a tree. A Dr. Turner recalled that the body went up, dangling on the rope, and a demoniacal yell surged from the crowd. It was hideous. That mob sounded like wild wolves. The yells were more like vicious snarls. Some even clapped their hands. Ship, quote, fought furiously for his life, burying his teeth in the arm of one of the lynchers in order to make him loosen his teeth. His skull was crushed with a crowbar and a knife was plunged into his heart. 16-year-old Cameron, the youngest of the three accused men, was ripped from his cell and nearly hung before someone in the crowd shouted that he was not involved in the crime. Sheriff Jacob Campbell was a friend of dad's family, often in the kitchen to drink some of the local moonshine after he, after he removed the bodies the following day. The crowd used pen knives to cut buttons and shreds of fabric from the victim's clothes as souvenirs. A 1930 Grant County grand jury began its investigation into the lynchings in September, where ultimately the jury decided that Sheriff Campbell handled the mob in a prudent manner and exonerated him 
of any responsibility for the deaths of Ship and Smith. From a list of 27 alleged participants in the lynching, which included clear evidence of their involvement, only seven men were arrested and two were tried. Uh, two were tried. Most of the whites who packed the courtroom were loudly jubilant when the accused men were acquitted. I recall dad only once mentioning this incident from his childhood, but it isn't clear to me whether he was a witness or just heard about this from his family and neighbors. And it's kind of a tough poem, but what Sandy earlier said about uh, mass amnesia needs to be broken through. So thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. I really appreciate you being here today. And again, uh, Larry's, Larry's work is work that really, um, if you're familiar with Larry's work, dives deep into, into uh, history of some serious injustices. I'll leave it at that. I could go on and on and talk about Larry's work. Please, again, all of the folks reading today have, uh, you know, as I said, any of our folks in an open mic on any day can be the features and have been the features. Um, so please, uh, if you're if you're connecting with their work today, look for their collections and support them and their presses. I'm going to go next to, um, as I said, I'm going to try to uh, focus on folks that we haven't heard from. Uh, and I'm going to go next to. Uh, I'm going to go next to Gary Huskisson, and I hope because I don't have I don't because we didn't all meet before to uh, verify folks reading today, uh, folks. I hope I'm pronouncing everyone's names correctly. Gary, welcome. Make sure, Gary. Yeah. He's here, but he's muted. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to scroll. Let's see if we can get Gary unmuted. And I, I sent him a message already, and he hasn't okay. responded. Okay. Well, let me go to. Let me go then to. Dan Duda is next, and we'll see if we can get back to Gary. Thanks, Dan, for being here today. Thank you very much. It is a real honor for me, and I'm here for the next, for the first time, and uh, I would like to express my uh, gratefulness for having the chance of reading just now, the first time, and I'm here. Um, I will read a poem which uh, I hope metaphorically expresses the idea of liberty, which does not depend only on the color of the face or of the uh, of the body, but it means something that uh, has to do with gender, with nationality, with a kind of criteria, with a lot of criteria which history considered objective and which weren't objective at all. I hope my poem will express better what I want to say. Thank you very much once again. Okay. I have to mention that in numerous languages in the world, the tree, the Christmas tree, is of female, feminine gender. It is very important in order to understand the text. Silent night too, there at the final station. As I write in Czech, the translation is signed by the Slovak poet Judith Antol. I'm not going to be your Christmas tree. I won't allow you to.
to cut me off my roots with your human aches, to steal my dead body from the forest, to bring it into your warm and cozy human home, to fasten it next to your warm and friendly human oven, to put on it some immaculately white human dress to make it your beloved human bride and to replace my mortal wild existence in the pagan forest with a human life that may become immortal after my next human death. If I manage to avoid human temptation to what we you call sin, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to be your Christmas tree. It's about time for you to learn. Christmas tree is a gender neutral, not a feminine, and for sure, not a common known. A Christmas tree just doesn't feel like being decorated according to your taste. A Christmas tree just doesn't feel like being decorated. A Christmas tree just doesn't feel being someone's Christmas tree. A Christmas tree just doesn't feel like being a Christmas tree at all for you. A Christmas tree is just a pretext for keeping alive the illusion of being able to make something more beautiful than it was. But how could you embellish something you killed in order to embellish? How could dead beauty add beauty to a beauty that is already dead? I'm not going to be your Christmas tree. I won't become the topic of some stupid human stories of yours. And if on Christmas Day, you find me lying down on the sidewalk, buried under the snow that has fallen the whole night on the little square at the final stop of the city train. Remember, I have never been your Christmas tree, for I choose to be someone else's. Nevertheless, if you really care so much about Christmas trees, you can always buy yourself an artificial one and order a personalized Christmas during the first week of January before the death of the three wise men. Thank you very much. End of poem. Thank you so much, Dan, and welcome. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon and hearing more of your work. I'm going to move us next to a poet that uh, we'd hoped to hear in in the open mic last week and wasn't able to, and um, and had we hadn't heard from for a while. So I want to move to next to Amy Berry. I'm I'm sorry. Uh... I'm sorry, uh, Sunday. I I I got it mixed up. It's the June tenth, and I'm my my poem is on abuse, so it's on abuse and justice. So it's I think it's a it's a bit different than. So I think I, I let it go then. All right, come, come and join us. <laughs> Next time, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate you being here, and I hope yeah, that and, and and thank you for everyone reading. I really appreciate listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. No worries. I'm going to now go back to um, and see if see if we can get Gary on the on the on the on the line here. If Gary's come back. I'm working off of, yeah, it does. Okay. Looks like they're just listening. So yeah, I've asked him to unmute Sandy and I, I don't okay. think he's with us now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, this is what happens when I go along. <laughs> I have a suggestion, um, yes, which so is if ahead. people are comfortable videotaping themselves with the poem they wanted to share um, and putting it up on the group page, that's a nice way to share since we've run out of time today. Yes, yes, that is, that is indeed. Thank you, thank you. That's a great suggestion. Well, folks, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone on the open mic today, and I appreciate you staying with us here for um, for the reading. Uh, again, I wanted to try to bring in those voices that we've not been hearing, that we hadn't heard from. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone's uh, interest and being here on this Juneteenth. Um, I did hear from, I did hear, um, I did hear that Cynthia, this poem is on point, particular to Juneteenth. So I'd like to actually, I'd like to actually honor that and have you close out the reading for today because your poem is related to the theme, if you would. And then I'll have some closing remarks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Mine is called Juneteenth That System. And it's, uh, you'll see what it's about. A brother and a sister, the tap tap of little feet. Social workers deterred us. Their hair makes it hard to fix. People don't know how to do it, you know, how to make it behave. And I thought the word behave isn't about hair, is it? I'd bring others in to teach me how to care for hair, for skin, for souls, doubting myself, timid, but never my choice to invite indigenous black people to be among. Tight, soft hair, warm brown skin. I only wondered how long must they wait for a home? My daughter tag along prostitution by four, 12 placements, is that enough? My son, cigarette burns, unspeakable scars, separate homes, they barely knew each other. Years of treatment, correction, thinking, questioned. For this, I'd stay up late nights, reading Langston Hughes at their feet, trying to soothe their ever alert minds, give them voice through black and native mentors. They would learn to act differently than they felt. It would not be enough to attend Juneteenth where they could be among crowds of similar shades. Words of the foster system adopted by us, a white family who apologizes through poetry. We were the only ones available, we'd say. They say, stop, mom, don't say that. So I stop. Indigenous, Arctic, Nigerian, Mali, and a bit like me, Scottish, Swedish, Norwegian. They both, as adults, have made it through everything thrown at them. They Juneteenth that foster care system as we had awkwardly quonsed them through books. At 10, 11, visited the deathbed of their mother, body bloated fragility before their eyes and I held their hands and held them in their letting go of wishes to ever go home to a home of dreams one that had so many times eluded them. We listened to their rage and frustration, fighting early years belonging to a system not so very different from enslavement. Shuffle here, shuffle there, you belong nowhere, so it matters not where you lay your head. Just listen to the memories you have mm -hmm. and never trust the new people to tell you what to do. Just try not to get too comfortable. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I want to thank everybody who signed up to join us in the open mic. And sorry, my facilitation didn't get to us all today. What a remarkable, remarkable afternoon, evening, morning of poetry. Uh, Mick Mesa is, is here from 
uh, is here from Australia, and so so it is Monday. It is Monday morning, actually, uh, for 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 Mick. My time zones allow me to share that with everybody. That we do really have the, the full range of morning, evening, afternoon. Thank you again to our readers in the open mic. We began with Latoya Whipple. We heard from Larry Kirshner. We then heard from Dan Duda and Cynthia Steele closed us out on our Juneteenth open mic. And we began, of course, one more time. I wanna just acknowledge the, the incredible um, depth of the poetry and the humanity, the history, the celebration, the complication of what the Juneteenth holiday um, represents uh, here in the United States, and as and as more and as more folks worldwide come to understand um, the significance of the Juneteenth, now that it's a federal holiday here in the U.S., I hope. Um, there will be more uh, understanding of um, of the what is behind the particular date and also the history that surrounded that has surrounded that date for centuries. I thank, of course, D. Allen, Teresa Gallian, Michael Anthony Ingram, Raul James, and Martina McGowan for truly embodying what it, truly embodying the feature role today with your incredible, powerful, powerful poetry. Uh, I do hope that those of you here that were able to be in the presence of this reading will share and encourage your friends that are on Cultivating Voices and elsewhere to join Cultivating Voices and watch the video of this reading with a, uh, just my heart is, my heart is full of the poetry. It's heavy and it's heavy and full. And um, I've been moved beyond belief. And I knew that that was the purpose for me today was to listen and to be moved and, and learn and continue to hold a space for all voices speak truth to power in the face of injustice and also celebrate resilience. Well, next week, everyone, we will be having another reading that will share in that celebration of resilience and also the challenges of pain and in violence and in humanity as we bring you our third annual poetry pride parade uh, we will we have a number of features lined up for next week's reading sylvia pollock who is here at the reading today will be one of our featured readers um, just a few folks from headmistress press risa denenberg uh, mary miriam mancho alvarado uh, who's uh, uh, who's uh, uh, whose book was chosen by Diane Seuss and is out now? Will be will be reading with us. Mary Oishi will be here, and I'm I, I should have the list in front of me, but we have a number of features. Come on back next week for our Poetry Pride Parade, where we'll also have an open mic uh, for those of you to and watch Donnelly. <laughs> Ann Walsh Donnelly, thank you. Yeah, Ann Walsh Donnelly, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, you've got all the names. With me. I, I have guess. a list somewhere. <laughs> you've got the list somewhere, thank you. It will this, be great. That's what we need to know. It will be great. It will be great. It will be, it will be great. It will be fantastic. It always, it has been, it will be, and will continue to be. All right, everybody. Uh, let me, let me, let me leave you today with thanks to Kim Ports Parsons for being my, 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 you know, my better half, <laughs> Don Krieger for being my better half, which means there's, you know, I'm not actually here. <laughs> there were better halves. And um, thanks for 
for their support throughout the program, to each one of you for being here today um, for this reading, and those of you watching on Zoom. Again, support, so you know, continue to support poetry where you can, support the poets and the presses um, that 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 share that are able to share the poetry with you, whether that's online or in print. And as I say, you know, every um, I wanted to I wanted to end with a quotation from one of my favorite poets, Audre Lorde. And Audre Lorde says, when I dare to be powerful in the service of my vision, it matters less and less whether I am afraid. It's amazing poet, Audre Lorde, uh, activist, humanitarian, teacher, so many things. To close out our Juneteenth reading today, those words from Audre Lorde. And my final words to you and my final words that I always say, which is everybody take good care of yourselves, be safe out there. And of course, keep writing your very remarkable, remarkable poems. I look forward to seeing you next week for a Poetry Pride Parade. Thank you. Be well. Happy Juneteenth and happy Father's Day. <laughs>